Tonight is a humbling experience because I'm amongst the unsung heroes of the earth, the retailers of the earth. Give yourself a clap. Because the retailers, uh, by definition, a retailer is a person that sells services or products directly to a consumer. He's not a wholesaler. He's not a, 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 what do you call that, a monopolist. He has to think of many things and in direct contact with the consumer. And there's always tough to sell whatever you have, you think you, what people need, and you have to meet them directly face to face. And this is the most competitive business in the world, uh, retailing business. When I was very young, I always loved retailing business. I'm born uh, with a retailing DNA. I love retailing. And uh, there was one time, uh, many, many years ago, I uh, had an opportunity to be a franchisee of a brand called Rosignol, a French brand with a, with a cockerel French brand. And they make tennis rackets and they make T-shirts. And I remember we made these T-shirts quite cheaply in China at that time, just 30 years ago. And I used to go to Isitan and all the supermarkets and hope that my T-shirt sells well. I used to sit there for hours, you know. And then I, I don't quite like when the position of Rosignol is not put in the right place. I will secretly adjust it so that people will see it a bit more. This is the passion of retailers. When you believe in your product, whatever your product, and I congratulate all the members here, 200 of them here tonight, who are congratulate yourselves for being so successful. I really honor and salute you retailers for being not giving up in such a tough business but i've learned in 1999 i've learned something when we took over marriott star hill lot 10 this hotel and uh, at that time and uh, remember the press uh, since you and all these nanyang are here they will still have headlines francis you is always so smart he took over this at such a cheap price so I bought these uh, assets at a cheap price, especially the shopping center, very cheap, 40 million at that time, Star Hill, or 30 million, Lot 10. Joyce Yap will know that's very cheap today. But at that time, when I bought it, well, I thought it was a reasonable price. But then, the, when I've completed the transaction, then I realized something, you know. There's a saying, uh, cheap things are not good, and good things are not cheap. So I bought so cheap, but actually when I came to the mall, the only guys paying rental on time is Louis Vuitton. The rest are not. And the, and the mall is like a bombed up mall. Everybody's emptying because nobody can survive. Even at that time in 1999, of course it was a recession. And I remember in Star Hill downstairs, instead of the swanky fish village which shook now, there were kids from... Uh, Bin, Bintang, Buki Bintang Girls School, which Joyce now put his pavilion, coming to eat uh, noodles at the firing gate. Here's Louis Vuitton and then the Buki Bintang Girls School girls <laughs> in Star Hill. And what's the revenue? Lot time worse. And then I realized, oh my God, you know, this is a seriously, uh, did I make a mistake in, the, in this area? And not to be a loser, of course, I believe my Lord Jesus Christ. God is, uh, you see, God is light. God all is light means what? All, we say all bright ideas. Bright ideas come from light, isn't it? So I go on my knees and ask God, I think I made a mistake. You know, it sounds good to own these properties, but look at the, the retail business, it's terrible. What do I do? So God gave me a lot of ideas. Learn and study. So I went to study what, is, what makes retail in Hong Kong or Singapore and I talked to all the retailers at that time, all the major retailers in the world. Like, a, like all of you who works very hard from the bottom, I met everyone and asked them, why is retailing in KL, why does it not work? Why is Singapore so successful? Why is Hong Kong so successful? And then I realized there were two main things that, uh, that stood up. One was that KL... It's a backwater of retail because we have a duty of 40%. So all the retailers 
at that time, Dixon Poon, I spoke to, and all the major retailers say, if you put duty to zero, we will come and seriously invest with you. So I said, really? Is that so simple? If I put retail and can convince the government that the duty goes to zero from 40%, you would uh, come and invest? And they say yes. And at that time, Dr. Mahade was a Prime Minister. I told the Prime Minister, Sir, you know, this is a country, if you seriously want retail to be competitive against Singapore or Hong Kong, we have to be another duty-free centre. And that's what actually Hong Kong is. Hong Kong was uh, duty-free, so was Singapore. So Hong Kong uh, thrived from a lot of people buying luxury goods in a duty-free area like Hong Kong. But the people who buy them are China, Japanese, uh, Koreans, and their duty was 40%. So they come to Hong Kong and buy them and resell them in, 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 the, in their own countries. So it's a parallel trade at that time, but Hong Kong thrived. Singapore the same. Singapore thrived on Southeast Asians going to Singapore, no duties, whereas Southeast Asian countries at that time, the duties were around 40%. So of course, people from Indonesia, KL, Manila, they go to Singapore to shop. So we say if we do the same thing, then maybe people come to shop. That time Mahadev was very, you remember Mahadev's, uh, he's got uh, guts. La. Within four months, we got duty free. Within four months. Of course, we protected the local retailers, remember? We said we had to protect local retailers. Anything uh, above, uh, 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 below 200 ringgit, we let the local re retailers thrive. Let them adjust to this competition. But we'll protect uh, Anything uh, below 200 ringgit, you know, we will protect the local retailers at that time. And that happened. And another thing happened was Bintang Walk. I think we got pictures what Bintang Walk was like at that time. And uh, Bintang Walk was, uh, was a place, it's going to be like a red light district. You know, it's like uh, everyone is touting women uh, and all sorts of things. So it was going down here like every city downtown, when you don't have ideas, you will go down the, the way. And it was a red light district almost, turning into a red light district. So we told the Prime Minister, why can't we have a mall, you know, the, uh, a walking, uh, a, like uh, walking, uh, what do you call that? Uh, a walk, just like Orchard Road, just like Sean Elise. Why can't we do that? So I remember the Prime Minister called the mayor at that time in his office and said, Francis has a very good idea. He wants to do this Bintang walk, right? And uh, do you have an objection? The mayor at that time, of course, how, who dared object against Mahathir? <laughs> Say, uh, yes. Uh, he said, no, no, that's not a bad idea. And uh, the Prime Minister looked at me. Okay, the mayor, no objection. When do you start? I said, tonight. Literally. So that night, we started work. And in six months, we created the Bintang Walk. And you look at it today, uh, look at slides, flip the slides, Elvin. As you see Bintang Walk evolve, this is what it's all about. Getting uh, retailers uh, from overseas to come and then creating a mall, uh, creating a walk like, uh, like La Ramblas in Barcelona or Orchard Road. Today, 50 million people walk on the mall. 50 million people walk in Bintang Walk today. Today, Bintang Walk today, Joyce will know, he just created this big reed called Pavilion Reed at 2,000 and above, ringgit per square foot. At that time when I bought it, it was 200. So in, from 1999 to today, it has multiplied tenfold. So that's great for the country. It's employed so many people in this street. This was a red light district. Now it's a hot district, hot for retail, uh, with pavilions, investments. And I remember at that time, uh, I was the biggest REIT uh, at that time, Star Hill REIT, to be listed on the stock exchange. And I like the idea of REIT as well at that time. It was also some of YTL's early ideas. Remember, I was, I was a committee member for capital markets, for, for and expanding the capital markets. The REIT was one great idea. If we have got revenues and rental with a lot of uh, people renting it stable, then we can create a REIT 
market expand for people to invest. And of course, the REIT today, look at Pavilion REIT, is uh, fantastic, 4-5% eh? return. So anybody who doesn't buy Pavilion REIT or Star Hill REIT must be not so clever. <laughs> if you put money in your bank and it's 3%, and then you can get joint Pavilion REIT at 6%, you, you should. You should go and buy the REIT. So that was the idea. The REIT grows, retailers grows, create a lot of employment and prosperity. And this has happened. This has happened, and I'm very pleased. Since 1999, the retail trade in Malaysia no longer is a backwater. This was something that I'm very, very pleased. So what happened after that is, do we stop here? We can't stop here. We are the youngest kid in the block in Asia for retail. If we stop here, the others are not going to stop. Hong Kong is not going to stop. Uh, Singapore is not going to stop. So we say, we got to continue. How do you continue? How do I make sure that KL is the retail center? Other than being duty-free like Hong Kong or Singapore, let's make it really something extraordinary. How do I do that? So I talked to all the retailers, and I knew the trick. The trick was KL, being the youngest kid on the block, the rental is a tenth of that of Hong Kong and a third of that of Singapore. So what does that mean? It means I told all these big watch people, all these big watch brands, say your watch, Omega, all these big brands, you can come to my shopping center, I'll actually give you two floors. I'll charge you the rent one third that of Singapore's, right, my neighbor. And you can display your firepower of your flagship store. The rent is peanuts. So in Hong Kong, you pay a thousand ringgit in the Peninsula Hotel for a watch shop. In here, at that time, it's 10 ringgit. So it's peanuts. And you can display your awesome power of your brand. Big shops. So Jaeger Lekut was the first to buy that idea. The first uh, Jaeger Lekut global store, Jaeger Lekut, you know, the name Jaeger Lekut from Switzerland was in Star Hill. And actually, from Star Hill were born 46 other global stores. Can you imagine? Jaeger LeCoultre started the idea of a global store in Star Hill and then found it worked and expanded in the whole of Asia, 46 other stores. And of course, every other watch retailer learned Jaeger LeCoultre's success and started to put big brands here. So Star Hill today is the biggest watch retailer on this whole 